on. There we go. Now we're on. Take out a copy of God's Word with you. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 14. We're going to be there again this morning. We started last week looking at the battle for the family, fighting for the family. And we'll continue that for several more weeks um, until we get prepared for Easter, the end of the month, and getting ready for Easter and Palm Sunday and all that great uh, encouragement time through God's Word as well. Um, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 14, and, and if you'll find or write down real quick, Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to get to Ephesians chapter 1 uh, toward the end of this, and we'll take a look at what that, how that implies to the family as well. Um, as we are looking at the family today, uh, we looked last week at an overview of Nehemiah and understand that Nehemiah was called to build a wall, uh, to wall around Jerusalem. Uh, the uh, Judah had been destroyed by Babylon, and Jerusalem was destroyed, taken into captivity for 70 years. Uh, the book prior to Nehemiah is the book of Ezra. Ezra was then allowed to come back with the first wave of those after 70 years, which God said would take place, and he rebuilt the temple. When that was finished, uh, Nehemiah, a cupbearer to the king in Nehemiah chapter 1, uh, Nehemiah heard that from his brothers that, that the wall was destroyed, and even though there was a temple built, uh, there was, the, the protection wasn't there, and he felt compelled to call upon God to move in his heart, to move on the king's heart, uh, to, to allow him to go and rebuild this wall with, with all the authority, with all the materials, and with, with, with all of the financial backing as well. And God moved upon the heart of the king in Nehemiah chapter 2, and God granted that. Now we're in Nehemiah chapter 4, the wall is being built, but there is a problem because there are, there are always those who don't like it when God moves. There are always those who don't like it when you begin to seek after God. Uh, there are always those around you that will distract you and try to pull you away from God. And that's what's happening in Nehemiah chapter 4. And then in verse 14, which is our launching pad, Nehemiah has this great leadership uh, ability to motivate everybody. He says, you're right, there are those out there that don't like this. There are those out there with, with uh, um, uh, an agenda to get us to stop doing what you've asked us to do. Uh, and so we agree. We see that out there. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to divide up and we're going to conquer. We're going to have those that are building and those that are out on the wall watching and protecting. So every time there's a shift, there's a shift change. We're going to have somebody building and somebody watching and they're going to build this wall and in, in numbers chapter 4 verse 14 and nehemiah says when i saw their fear he saw the fear within his own people and he says i rose and i spoke to the nobles the officials and the rest of the people do not be afraid of them remember the lord who was great and awesome and fight for your brothers your sons your daughters your wives and your house fight for your family fight for them uh, but let's be honest we are battling a tough war. Your family makeup, we're all different. We have single parents. We have those dealing with blended families. We have those that uh, we would say are the family unit, but they're not normal, okay? There is not one normal family whatsoever in this room. We, are all, we all have a battle, and it, it is raging, and it seems hopeless, there is, there is distress signals being sent up. There are those who want to throw in the towel. we got to realize that we are fighting a war. Our culture, the flesh, that's the kind of culture, a fleshly battle uh, that wants to tear the family unit apart. And, and we have to say, you know what, today is the day that whatever your family makeup is today, whatever that is today, that's my family makeup, and today begins a brand new day. Today I begin looking at this differently and not for my oh's and woes and all of the complaints of the arsenal that's being shot at me. Today's a brand new day and I'm going to, as we ended that with so perfectly, that God is in tune with Randy and I. We are just in sync. That's a scary thought. We will serve the Lord. You say, my family, whatever that unit is, we are a family and we will begin today to serve the Lord. But what if you're on that ring canvas? You've been hit by all kinds of arsenal in your family. I mean, distress. And if you were to come up and to just list it, it would just take all day to say, but 
you don't realize the punch has been thrown at us. I don't know if God wants me to serve him. I don't know if I'm worthy enough to get off that, off that canvas and to say, God, I'll serve you. I don't know if I'm, if I'm there. I want you to know, God says you're worthy. Amen. You see, Jesus died for us because we were unworthy. He died because of that very reason. In his death, in his resurrection, it was there so that you and I could become worthy. You're not worthy on your own. You're right. You deserve the 10 count. You deserve to be on that canvas. You're absolutely correct. Every single one of us has made a mess out of life. And I stand out here just like everybody else. I may wear a coat and sometimes a tie. But underneath this coat is a mess. I'm not perfect. I got my faults. It's like everybody else. But one thing that I realized is that God says you're worthy. And so I live my life in such a way that has that lives with the motivation of what God says, not what I say. Not not what everybody else says. But but how does God look at me and what does God say to me? And God tells me to fight. He says, I want you to fight for your family. I want you to fight. So I'm going to give you the good news today that you can fight with your family. I'm going to give you a strategy on how you can fight for your family. But before we get to the strategy, I, I also want you to know what it's like to be knocked out. You ever been knocked out? Yeah, I remember as a kid playing hide and seek. That's the days when we could actually play like the whole block. We, uh, the whole block was hide and seek. You know, all the neighborhood kids would get together and the whole block was game. I mean, as long as we stayed on that block, man, all the neighbors knew us and it was, it was cool with them, um, except for the, dog, the ones with dogs. We stayed away from those houses. But uh, we had a whole block. And so I was, I was running across our porch trying to get away from being tagged because they found me. And, I, and it was a long porch, had a big wall. And I went to put my hand on the wall and to make a Starsky and Hutch that dates me, I know, and kind of fling myself, launch myself over the wall and just keep right on going. My hand missed the wall. So I'm running across there and my hand misses the wall and I just do this somersault head first. I hit the concrete and I remember seeing stars. Now, I don't remember what happened the next two days. I have no recollection of it whatsoever. But I remember falling and seeing stars, and I'm thinking, wow, this was bad. Two days later, they're telling me about it, and I barely remembered it, other than the star part. So the reason I'm telling you something is because I don't remember a lot of that. And that's what happens in our families. We get knocked out. We get what they call flash KO. You know what a flash KO is? That means when you've been in the fight and, and you were stunned by a blow. And you just stood there. Your brain rattled and you froze. You just, what they call your bell got rung. Others, it's called just a stunned KO, and it means that your brain was rattled, but you're able to walk around, but you're slurred in speech. <laughs> you, you, you make no sense, and you wander in the ring. You don't even have any clue what you're doing at that moment. Your family may be hit by one of those things. You didn't, you didn't see it coming. I never saw that punch. I never saw that. It was not on my horizon whatsoever. You're doing everything that you think is absolutely correct to protect your family and, and to make it stronger and to make it better. And all of a sudden, it just comes out of nowhere. But then there was what they call the clean knockout. It hits you so hard, next thing you know is that you are on the canvas and you hear the count, but you can't do a single thing about it. You're just laying there. And there is no getting up. They call that, you've been rocked. Your family may be in one of those situations. And you feel like, once again, there is no hope. And I want you to know what those punches look like. So I want to prepare you for them because they're going to come. No family is immune to it. No family. I've got friends of mine that, that, that have, have lost children Young ages, had to bury them. That's not, we say that's not right, but it's happened. 
I've had friends of mine, their kids have committed suicide. Very prominent pastors have gone through that very same thing. Say, well, th- those guys, nothing ever bad happens to them, and yet they're walking through darkness. So I want you to know what there are five punches. There are more, but I'm going to give you five of them today that you need to be aware of that can come out of the blue and all of a sudden stun you at any point. And here is number one, busyness. Busyness hits every single one of us, whether you're a child here today, whether you are a teenager, young adult, middle age, or whether you are a senior adult. Let me tell you what, senior adults, you are busier than anybody else I ever know. I mean, your schedules are filled. <laughs> you want to be busy, right? Yeah. So I want you to know that when it comes to, to scheduling things, we can be hit by busyness. But yet we read in Matthew when Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And we wonder, what? Rest. Rest when? Well, where will ever I find that balance in life where I can just rest in your presence, God? And, and it's just like life, life happens and I'm in control of it. I have balance. Will that ever be possible? Most of us, we feel guilty at this point. And I'm right with you. I mean, things are, I mean, my calendars are just filling up. Will I ever stop? They say when your children get married, you slow down. Really? I don't think so. I want to talk to you afterwards. I got a few questions. Busyness happens. Matter of fact, there's a book called The Acceleration of Just About Everything. And in this quote, it says this, Our computers, our movies, our prayers, they all run faster now than ever before. And the more we fill our lives with time-saving devices and time-saving strategies, the more we rush to feel. We're just filled. It happens. And yet, sometimes we feel like busyness is a badge of honor. I'm a, I'm a multitasker, that's what we say. I can do five things at, the, at once. We say, great. You ever have time to sleep? How about eat? How about just enjoy life for a moment? But we're so busy, we can't do that. We're rushing from here to there, and, and, and we get hit as a family. Remember when uh, Shelby was born? That was pretty cool. Mom could take care of her. I was good. Sydney came along, okay, we each got one. Seth came along, it changed our whole world. But you know, I I was taking care of Seth and she was with Sydney. Well, who's with Shelby? Oh, no. And then it was, I got Shelby, you got Sydney. What about Seth? Oh, man, what is this world coming to? We're going to be horrible parents. You know, we leave one at the church. You ever left a child at the church? Now, some of you better raise your hands because I know I've had to call you. Come get your child. Man, you know, it, it, it becomes zone parenting. Not to scare you with one child over here, you know, our child section over here. It's, life is good, but it changes everything when you have more than two. It's like, oh, what am I going to do? Busyness, it happens to all of us, but yet we wear it with a badge of honor and say, I survived. I got the T-shirt. But deep inside, we long for a simpler life, don't we? We, we long for that meaningful life. I want you to know that punch can hit you and it can rock your world. Watch out for busyness. Watch out for laziness. We can become lazy. Titus chapter 1 and 2 through 3, Paul talks about the Cretans. And if you're a Cretan today, I'm sorry, but this is how he describes you. He says, you're liars, you're evil beasts, you're lazy gluttons. This idea of lazy throughout the word of God is always attached to wickedness. And we can be so wrapped up in our world, we become lazy, and it hits us. We aren't doing anything because we're afraid to do anything. So we don't do anything. We just lazy. We're lazy. Matter of fact, Jesus talked about the parable of the servants with the talents. He said, to the one that I gave, but you didn't do anything with it, you just hit it. He says, you wicked and lazy slave, don't you know? You could have at least put it in the bank where it would draw interest. Don't become lazy. Watch out for laziness. Laziness could come out of busyness because we're so busy we get to the point where we can't, we can't do anything so we become lazy and we just stop living. We figure there's no use anyways. 
Be careful of laziness. Be careful of unforgiveness. Unforgiveness will short-circuit God's blessings for your life, regardless of who did it. doesn't matter. It's just realize you have to learn to forgive, regardless. Jesus taught us the ultimate sacrifice of forgiveness. Hanging on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You've got to be honest. Let's be really honest this morning. How many of you are at that point where you could truly say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do? I've got to be honest. That's tough. Because I look at me and say, I can't. They know what they're doing. <laughs> Wouldn't Jesus say, I'm not going to forgive them, Father, they know what they, they put me on a cross. What do you mean they don't know what they're doing? He said, Father, they don't know, they don't understand what they're doing. Father, forgive them. Jesus taught us in the Lord's, in his, in his model prayer. He said, understand that when you pray, you're going to pray to who I am. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, you're going to stand there. You understand who God is and that God supplies all your needs and understand that God provides the power of forgiveness. Because if you will not forgive, my Father will not forgive you. So unforgiveness will short-circuit God's blessings in your life. You will never experience God's fullness if you're going to carry unforgiveness. I'm not going to forgive you, as the parent says to the child. I'm going to hold this over your head the rest of your life. What about you as a teenager? Teenagers, talk to me. Listen at me. Kids, look at me. Don't live your life with this burden of saying, I'm not going to forgive my mom and dad. Several years ago, when, when we say several years ago, it could have been 10 or 15, you know, it was a while ago. I had to call my dad. I said, Dad, I got some things I need to talk to you about. And I was just, God is just rocking me. He knocked me out. <laughs> God just, boom. And I had to call my dad over stuff when I was a teenager. I had to apologize for. I had not forgiven him. He and I had this phone cry conversation that my dad and I don't normally do. We're not those kind of guys, but we did. God was just working in my heart. I just had to ask for forgiveness. And my dad tried to explain why. I said, Dad, I'm sorry. So I'm telling you, kids, don't live that life with this burden of, of unforgiveness to your mom and dad. Don't do that. It'll hinder your relationships as you go into college, as you get married. You'll always have that there. Forgive them. Time will come where you can talk about it. Time will come where it begins to, but forgive them now. Forgive them now. Uh, Peter was asking Jesus, well, how many times do I need to forgive? The law says up to three. And, and Peter's like, hey, do I have to do it seven times? I'm willing to double plus one. And, and Jesus said, oh, no, it's 70 times seven. Now, he didn't give a specific, he wasn't saying, okay, at that point you just stop forgiving. He just said, it's a large number. You continue to forgive. It's really important to understand this. Because as a believer in Christ, you owe it to your Heavenly Father, because He forgave you of your sin. Think about your own personal life, and when you ask God into your heart, you said, Father, forgive me, and what that truly meant, all the things you had done to hurt God, and He wiped it clean. You owe it to God as a believer. If you're not a believer today, that doesn't make sense. I understand that's okay. I'm going to invite you at the end of the service to come to know Christ as your personal Savior and forgive you of your sin, and then you'll understand what it means to be forgiven and how you need to pass that on to others. Unforgiveness will just ring your bell every time. It will, it will come crashing down. Watch out for poor communication. 
Watch out for this one. Boy, this will surprise you. You think you're, you're speaking very clear. And out of the blue, they're doing something totally strange. Like, what, what, what happened just there? Didn't I just say? And you're trying to figure out, how do you communicate? There was an elderly couple. They were celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. And the husband really wanted to talk to his wife and just get up and just share how much she meant to him. And, and knowing that she was hard to hear, he tried to make it very clear. And he said, dear wife, after 50 ye wonderful years, you have been my tried and true. She said, what? And he said a little bit louder. After 50 years, I found you tried and true. And she became really angry. And she said, well, after 50 years, I'm tired of you too. <laughs> Poor communication. It happens. We think we're talking very clear, and it's received totally different. And I know we've got men and women, and, and, and guys, we talk differently, don't we? Wives are like, yeah, they don't talk at all. <laughs> you know, we have communication issues. And when you've got poor communication issues, guess what happens? You become irritable. And when you become irritable, you feel like you're being annoyed. And if you're being annoyed, you feel like nobody's listening to you. All because of poor communication. It's just a big circle, this big ball. And it can destroy a family. Watch out for that punch that comes. Financial stress. Gary will hit, hit this if you're in his financial class on Sunday nights. Financial stress will hit you. According to the recent survey conducted by Capital One, this was just, just this February, this past month, 77% of Americans report they're worried about their financial situation, including close to 10 in 6 Americans indicate their lives are controlled by their finances. The impact of financial stress is bondage takes a toll on your well-being. Constant headaches, stomach upset, irritability. Hmm. Oh, might be a communication problem when it comes to finances. But irritability, fatigue. Debt doesn't just affect your finances. It impacts your mind, your body. Uh, numerous surveys after surveys and studies of talking about financial stress and understanding that what happens is we start carrying this large amount of debt and you can't find your way out. One of the causes of financial stress is unrealistic expectations. As you, as you grow and mature, you become, you get a job, and you, you get this job, and then you think, oh, I can get this and this. You see all the stuff out there. You have this unrealistic of life and of relationship. It's just this unrealistic view. And so to resolve it, you think, I just need more stuff because stuff makes me happy. And so you buy more stuff, and you get more stuff, and then you trade that for something else. You have this, this whole life of stuff. And guess what's happened? You've piled up this huge amount of debt, and now you're in financial stress, and you don't know what to do. And all of a sudden, you find yourself in the, on the bottom of this ring, and you're hearing the 10 count. From busyness, laziness, unforgiveness, poor communication, financial stress, and you're hearing one. Two, three. You're hearing the count. And you don't know if you should even get up. Because if I get up, what am I going to get up to? More busyness, laziness, more unforgiveness, more poor communication, more financial stress. Why do I want to get up with that? So I want to find a way out. I don't know how, but I don't want to get up to that again. I've already, that's what brought me here. And so I want to give you the hope. And here is the hope. And this is, this is what he, Nehemiah says. And he says, fight for your family. Get up and fight. So you got to train, change the strategy. You can't get up and keep fighting the way you have been fighting. And every time I think about just getting up and fighting the same way I think of the, the Rocky movies, okay? The guy just gets up and just keeps his hands down. Just keep getting beaten. Don't know. Learn to fight differently. And finally, he learns to fight differently. Keep the hands up. So we're going to fight differently. So I need a volunteer to help me today. We've got a volunteer. Brandon, I love you, man. You're a senior. So I'm going to give you a couple things. And, and just, just come sit in the front row. Just sit in the front row with me. It's the danger of sitting down front and looking, looking sharp like, like Brandon is today. So you're going to help me out. We're going to learn to fight differently. So I need you to put a Bible right up here in the corner. 
Right there. All the items are right there. So you just kind of set it up, set it up. There you go. All right, so we're going to learn to fight differently. And, and the first thing, so every time that you see this, every time you see the Word of God, I want you to do this. I want you to seek God. Seek God means to make an intentional commitment to God. You know when you go to Walmart, there are certain things you buy an impulse, like potato chips, Pepsi. There are certain things you can walk through the hunting aisle and say, I, I need that. I don't own anything, but I need that. That flashlight's really cool. Or you, you go to the home interior section, I need this. You buy impulse. But there are certain things. You go to the pharmaceutical department. I'm not impulsive at buying certain items. I don't need. There, there's no commercial in the world will ever get me to buy that item. I do not need that. Only time I need that is when the doctor says, you need that. Then you understand what that is all about. I want you to make, let's be intentional at seeking God. Let's make it number one priority. You're going to get off this mat. You have been blasted with the pounding of life. I want you to get up differently and say, guess what? I'm going to seek God. I need a new trainer. <laughs> I need a new coach. And so I want to seek God with all my heart. And, and how, what does that look like? Well, the book of Ephesians explains it in the first three chapters. He says you need salvation. Because if you get up the way you are, you're dead. You'll never get up. So you need to get up differently, and that's when you understand, but by the grace of God, he provides salvation. Salvation is a relationship with God who knows how to fight, who knows how to win. And so I want to learn from him, and it's called salvation. So chapters 4, 5, and 6 deal with, now how do I, how do I look differently? What, what, what's the different way of living? Well, chapter 5. I want to walk through chapter 5. I'm going to give you a real quick synopsis of what your life looks like when you've accepted Christ. Number one is Ephesians 5.1. You're going to imitate God. You need to learn to imitate God. Well, what does God look like? Well, verse, verse 3 says you put out impurity and immorality behind you because that doesn't look anything like you. So you chip away at the things that don't look like God. If that's not the way God would act, that's not the way God would do things, guess what? I'm not going to do it either. So I'm going to seek him. I'm going to put away the things that don't look like God. In verse 6, he says, don't let anyone deceive you with empty words. Mm, I've got to be very careful with the words that I hear. Don't let people de deceive you into buying things you don't need. I was at Walmart, I don't know, a couple weeks ago. I don't know, a month ago. And this guy was walking around with these free tickets. Hey, did we're giving away this free stuff. I said, free stuff? I'm at Walmart? Hey. So I, they had to go sit through this whole presentation. I'm like, oh, really? I knew that was going to happen. But I thought, well, maybe this is my lucky day. Maybe this is the day where I get something really good. And you know what I got? This little finger hold for your phone. All for sitting through this long production about ice packs. I was like, really? I could have used an ice pack at that point to put on my head. Loser, right there, you know, really? Watch out for the empty words that people deceive you and they make you think you're getting some big deal if you go this way. He said, let no one deceive you with empty words. In verse 15, walk not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of your time. God has granted you time on earth. Use it for his kingdom. Build a different kingdom. Build his kingdom. In verse 18, it says, don't get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, what's he doing? He's, he's saying, I want you to imitate being God-controlled. What controls you in your life? Is it the world? This issue of wine becomes an illustration of the world. Are you allowing wine to control you? Are you allowing the things of this world to make you do things you wouldn't normally do if you could think logically? So he says, what? No, be controlled what? By the Holy Spirit. Allow a God-controlled life. To guide you and direct you. That's why he said, don't act like unwise, but as wise. And he does the same thing. Wine spirit. He said, hey, look, this is how you do things. And then he goes on and says, now, let me communicate God's love to you. Wives, submit. Husbands, sacrifice. Children, obey. And then he comes after that. He says, now, understand, you're in a battle. Put on the armor of God, all of you. So he's saying, this is what it looks like to seek God first. This is what it looks like to be a God-battling 
fighter. If you're going to fight for your family, you've got to seek God first. Okay? Now, number two, we have a, a game. All right, put a game up here. You have to play together. I'm going to seek God with all my heart, but I've got to learn to know my kids. I've got to learn to know my wife. I've got to learn to know who I am. We do it by playing. And you as a family have to learn to play games together. You have to learn to, to relate together in life in a fun way. Enjoy one another. Now, everybody plays differently. I don't play cards with my wife because she beats me. She is smarter and wiser and faster than I'll ever be. I don't play cards with my kid. Well, I can play cards with Seth. But I can't play with Shelby and Seth. They're, they're just, I can't do it. I can't play strat, okay, but we can play in the backyard. We played tons of tag football until I couldn't outrun my kids. And then we turned it into something different to where I could win. <laughs> you constantly play with your kids. And it changes as they grow, but, but bond with them. As a family, say, hey, are we playing together? And as you play together, guess what you're doing? You're building relationship together so that when you're seeking God together, you have a common ground. So I, I want to seek God with all my heart, but I want to learn to play. Too. I want to have fun with them. I want to learn to have life with them and do things together. And to know that sometimes your kids want to do things that you're not interested in. Mom, Daddy, I, I don't get some of the stuff my kids like. I'm not into it, but I try. And as I do that, and then I, I share, we share spiritual things. It's more meaningful because they know we're a family. And they know that if I try something that they like, they got to try something that I like. <laughs> you got to learn to kind of play the game, right? And you got to work with it. But you as a family got to have fun. Whether it's outside, you're an outside family, love outside stuff. If you're an inside family, love inside stuff. But seek after God and make it so that what you do is God-honoring. Make sure it connects the dots. There are some things in life that we say that's a game, but that's not just a game. That actually can be a distraction, and so you have to know the difference. And so as we are looking at trying to structure our family around a family that's going to stand together and fight, I have to learn how to play, how to enjoy life. Well, number three is a watering can. A watering can just reminds me i got to grow. Jesus says that in Luke chapter 2, that as he was growing, it says three things. He grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God. He says wisdom is the mental emotional growth. You have to grow. You have to have stature, you have to have physical growth. You have to learn to have growth that's in favor with God, that's spiritual growth. Now, Luke also tags the favor with man in here, so you could separate it. I have four. He says favor with God and man. Man is the social growth. And so if I understand that Jesus grew that way, I understand I've got to grow that way, and I begin to realize that I've got to teach my kids to grow that way too. And so I grow my family through example, conversation, encouragement, and compassion. I learn those things. But what I want to avoid is the comparisons. We're not like somebody else. We're our own unique family. And I realize that God has gifted us. God has called us. And I want to help my family serve him. I want to help my family understand that God called them and gave them specific interests and desires and, and to use those things in a God-honoring manner so that we can grow in Him. I don't know where God's going to take our, our kids. I have no idea. No clue. But my desire is where God takes them, they'll grow in Him. Where God takes them, They'll, grow, and they'll remember the things that we played together. They'll remember our Bible study times we've had, whether it was a, just a thought or whether it was a, a deep question that 
I got this yesterday. I just had my phone up here. And I'm sharing a lot of family stuff because I have no family here today. They're not here this morning. They were here earlier. Um, so I don't owe anybody five bucks. That's the deal. I use them in illustration, they get five bucks. I just deducted off the grocery bill, but anyway. Um, I got this text yesterday from Sydney. She said, Dad, um, Hebrew, Israelites, and Jews, what's the difference and why? I got that like at 3 o'clock. I'm like, I'm not answering that. I, I got to think. <laughs> so about 9 o'clock, I finally text her back. <laughs> Hopefully she'd forgotten about the text by then. Uh, but she's always coming up with these Bible questions that are deep. So she, and then the day before, it was this question. Dad, how do we know the serpent in, the, in, in, John, in Genesis chapter 3 is really Satan? How do you know that? It doesn't say he's Satan. I said, well, because Dad said so. <laughs> thought that was pretty smart. Dad, come on. So I uh, had to think and pray as I'm thinking and, and you know, went to, went to the book of Revelation where it says the serpent. Okay, right there is a connection. But anyway, she's coming up with tough questions. I understand that every, every child is different. And they're going to challenge you at points, but I want them all to come back to number one. I want them to seek God no matter what they're doing. Some of those questions were based on assignments. Some of them are just random. But through our, our interaction, she knows she can ask anything she wants. She knows that. She knows I don't know all the answers. I want you to learn to grow together as a family. Bring the coat up here. This coat represents what happens through all of this is that we learn to protect each other. We learn to protect one another. Paul's always inviting in his journeys, you'll, you'll see this, Paul's always inviting others to come along because he needs one. You need uh, each other. You need others. That's why the church family is so huge. You need a family that protects you. You need God to protect you, but you need your family to be a place of protection where you're not going to allow for someone to come in and destroy your walls. You're not going to allow someone to come in and destroy the temple to take your focus off of God. I don't allow that here. I'm sorry, that is, does not belong in our family. That's protection. And you need others to protect you as well. You need others to know you. And we need to know that, that when we walk with God, we're not alone. Mom and Dad, I just want to tell you, I just want to encourage you right here to protect your kids. They don't have to do everything everybody else is doing. You put your foot down at times and say, no, we're not doing that. I want to share this because it's, it's, it's a struggle. Travel sports. I'm stepping on my own toes here, okay? Because that's where my son's at today. <laughs> now, he came to Sunday school. We have a rule. Got to go to church regardless of what time the game is. He's had to go to a lot of early services and a lot of Saturday night services. God's got to do it, okay? If you're going to do it. But we have some rules, and that is tournaments are different because the coach has no control over when the games are scheduled. They're, they're their place when they are. Luckily, right now, he doesn't have to worry about championship games. You'll laugh at that in just a minute. <laughs> gonna... but, but regular games, we have a choice because the coach schedules regular games. So in about a month from now, there was a Sunday morning game at 1130. It wasn't going to allow for early service, and it wasn't going to. Uh, and I, so I emailed the coach. I said, Coach, look, you need to know where our stance is. I told him that back in the fall. I had to remind him. We don't do regular games at that time. I'm sorry. You make it 1 o'clock or later, we'll play. You make it during church time, we're not going to play because that's something you can control as a coach. You can do that. Now, I was very polite about it. I said, I understand tournaments. We try to make everything we're committed to, and we make it work. But regular schedules, no. You have a choice, coach. Very next day, he said, Scott, thank you for reminding me. That game's been changed at 2 o'clock. Now, he could have come back and said, sorry. I would have said, okay, Seth won't be there. He knew that. I honored him, and I just said, this is the way we are. 
there are certain rules you just have to say, you know what, these, these apply. I want my kids to understand that before anything else happens, we seek God. We're going to enjoy God. We're going to understand his principles, and he is going to surround us with everything else. Everything else is going to serve here. That's what I do for mine. Now, your kids are different. I'm not telling you how to parent your child. I'm just saying, hey, keep God first. Enjoy the times with them so that way you, you have a bonding experience. Help them to grow in, in wisdom in all stature of life. Protect them. Put this coat on and say, hey, I'm the protector. I'm going to lead my family. So that when they get out on their own, they've got to make their own choices. What are they going to base it on? What they were raised with. Now, they're going to make some changes. Although we say we're not going to be like our parents. <laughs> Every day I'm more like my dad. <laughs> so I, I understand that, but, we're gonna, but we have a value system. And maybe your value system wasn't based on God. Guess what? Today's a new day, right? You can get off the canvas today and say, yes, today's a new day. I'm going to learn today to, to honor God first and foremost. Amen. I'm going to do things different. My parents didn't play with me. Well, play with your kids. Do things differently. I don't know how to grow. I wasn't developed. Well, guess what? You can today. You can learn to protect. You can learn to say no. I'm not hanging out with you. I'm not doing that. The last thing. The globe. It reminds me to serve. God has called us to serve. We've spent time here at New Life talking about that word serve. But serve together. Do things as much as you can together. Now, I know that changes. Once again, one kid, okay, two kids, three kids, oh, well, I don't know, how are we going to serve together? Things change, but serve together. Do what you can. Find places of service here in the church together. Find places where you can serve in other ministries together. Learn, educate, take them on opportunities. Each of our kids have had opportunities to serve in different capacities, looking at, at life from a different perspective. I'm going to champion Cody here for just a moment because there's a decision that has to be made about a mission trip. And Seth hardly says two words. Some of you know that. I mean, getting a sentence out of him is radical. But he said, Dad, I want to go on that mission trip. I said, you, you realize the cost, and it, we're not talking about financial, but just what that means, because that's a week that our tryouts for the soccer teams, that week is always, it's that week that everything, everything shuts down and all the tryouts happen. I said, do you realize that? He says, yes, but we can make exceptions, right? I said, you betcha. I said, I just want you to know, it's an entire week away from mom and dad. He said, yeah, and he smiled. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, Cody, what's going on? I'm just telling you, you're getting him, Okay. Or you're getting it. I don't know, one of the two. But he wants to learn to serve. He was the one I've been worried about. <laughs> I'm not for sure. What do you think? Serve together. But we serve here. He helps out with the food pantry. All of our kids have helped out in different areas of, of church life. They've learned to learn to serve. Get your kids. Serve together with them. Not just in a church thing, but even outside the church. They've each done kind of small mission stuff with us. At, for their age group. Take your kids on mission. Now, I guarantee you if, you, if you seek God, you learn to play, you learn to, to grow and teach, you protect and you learn to serve, you don't have time for anything else. You want to know how to, to reduce your busy life and so you're not hit with all the punches? You put these things in place, it will take care of your schedule. And you become in control, right? And you place that in what? In God's hands. I take this and say, God, I want you to have my schedule. I want you to teach me how to raise my family. Joshua told the Israelites as they were conquering the land, he drew a line in the sand. He says, guess what? You can either live like the world, like the Philistine and the Canaan. You can live like that or you can honor God. He said, but for me and my house today, he drew a line in the sand and says, we will serve the Lord. What are you going to do? Where's your family going to end up? 
Now, that doesn't mean that your family is going to be perfect and they're going to be, a, they're going to be preachers. Boys, you're all going to be preachers. That doesn't mean that at all. It doesn't mean you ladies are all going to be preacher wives. Not going to mean that at all. But it does give you the foundation. And rest assured this, when you train them, as the Word says, they'll have that training there. They're going to make their own decisions, but give them a foundation of spiritual values. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today, and you have challenged us to fight. And my prayer is we've got families that are going to surrender today to you. They're going to get off that mat, and they're going to seek you with all their heart. I pray that there's going to continue to be prayer for those that we've been praying for each and every Sunday to, to come and to, to, just to worship with us, their family members, their friends, their neighbors. I know Satan is going to, to attack us as soon as we leave here. They're, he's going to, to want to devour us and to, to knock us out. But I pray that today becomes a day where we hear Nehemiah say, Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your houses. I pray we fight. Not with our own effort, but by putting on your armor. I pray, Father, today we remember who you are and we say thank you. Today is a new day for our family.